2015 is shaping up to be a big year in the climate change debate. In December, world leaders are due to meet in Paris to finalise an international agreement to halt global warming. To which you might say, so what? Don't we already have at least one global climate treaty and don't we have these climate talks all the time? Well, the answer is yes and yes, but Paris is still going to be important. And to see why, we're going to take a trip down the River Thames in London, starting here in Battersea. It seems incredible now, but until it closed in 1983, Battersea Power Station generated a huge amount of London's electricity. It did it by burning millions of tonnes of coal right here on the river, just a walk away from Buckingham Palace and the Houses of Parliament at Westminster. It was a similar story in cities around the world. But by the late 1980s, scientists were starting to warn that this had to stop because burning coal and other fossil fuels released greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere, trapping heat and causing global warming. As scientists started taking their warnings directly to politicians, world leaders decided to act. The reason that we hear so much about climate talks today is that 20 years ago, it was decided the UN would hold annual discussions where leaders from various countries could meet to discuss how they would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Those annual UN climate change talks were based on a treaty that had been agreed in the early 1990s at a big Earth summit in Rio de Janeiro that attracted everyone from the first George Bush to Bianca Jagger. The treaty had a fairly clunky title, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It was aimed at stabilising greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere to stop what it called dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. But greenhouse gas concentrations continued to rise along with global temperatures because the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change didn't legally require any of the countries signing up to it to actually do anything. So in 1997, another global climate treaty, the Kyoto Protocol, was agreed in the Japanese city of the same name. The Kyoto Protocol was legally binding, but only for the wealthy countries whose pollution since the Industrial Revolution had caused the climate problem. They agreed that they would share the burden of cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Poorer countries, including China and India, were not required to act. And that made some sense at the time, because in 1997, the biggest emitter by far was the United States. But emissions kept rising, partly because the US never ratified the Kyoto Treaty, which many members of Congress opposed because it didn't require action from America's fast-growing economic rival, China. And by 2006, China had overtaken the US to become the world's largest carbon polluter, while emissions from other emerging economies such as India were growing fast. Meanwhile, warnings about the extent of the climate change problem continued to grow. This is the Thames Barrier. It's one of the world's biggest flood defence structures. It was built more than 30 years ago to protect London from flooding. The number of times it's been closed has gone up from four times in the 1980s to 35 times in the 1990s and 75 times in the first decade of this century. That's partly because of heavier flooding upstream, which is something scientists say could worsen as the climate changes. On top of that, as the oceans warm and ice caps melt, sea levels are expected to keep rising and that's also likely to put pressure on the Thames Barrier in future. It was obvious a new climate treaty was needed that would cover all countries' emissions. So the annual UN climate negotiations, which are usually held in December each year, shifted focus and work began on agreeing a new global pact in Copenhagen at the end of 2009. That meeting was widely deemed to have been a failure. Leaders did agree that there shouldn't be a rise in global temperature of more than two degrees from pre-industrial times, but there was no agreement on the practical measures needed to achieve that. To have a reasonable chance of limiting warming to two degrees Celsius and avert potentially dangerous climate change, scientists have calculated that no more than around a thousand gigatons of carbon dioxide could be emitted from 2012 onwards. But with energy-related CO2 emissions alone getting close to 40 gigatons a year, plus other emissions from activities such as cutting down tropical forests, that means the entire so-called carbon budget could be used up by the 2030s. 
After the failure of Copenhagen, the future of the UN negotiations looked decidedly bleak. But eventually, it was decided that fresh efforts would be made to try to seal a global climate pact in Paris in December 2015. Countries have already started putting out their plans for emission reductions in the lead up to the Paris meeting. But the challenge they face really is enormous. To take the energy sector alone, coal still accounts for around 40% of the world's electricity needs. And modern renewables, like these wind turbines further down the Thames here at Tilbury Docks, only account for around 9% of the world's power generation. At current rates of growth, it's going to take until 2030 before they reach 20%. So that just shows the size of the task that countries face in coming up with a meaningful emissions reduction plan in Paris at the end of this year. The Paris meeting could easily end up being a rerun of Copenhagen, although there are some important differences. For one thing, there's no global financial crisis as there was in the lead up to Copenhagen, which distracted world leaders at the time. And for another, the US and China, as long ago as November last year, agreed on plans to cut their respective emissions, something they failed to do well ahead of Copenhagen. Importantly, the world has started to add more power capacity based on renewables rather than fossil fuels, such as those that were burnt for years here at the Tilbury Power Station on the Thames. Throughout this year, all countries are due to spell out to the UN how they plan to tackle climate change. By the end of the year, the UN is due to report on what all of those voluntary measures actually add up to. Now, it's unlikely that they will be enough to reach the two degree target. But the Paris meeting is supposed to come up with some form of blueprint that will turn these voluntary measures into some form of durable emissions reduction plan. We still don't know exactly what that blueprint might look like and critics say there's a chance that it won't be enough to halt dangerous levels of climate change. Still, there is a chance that 2015 will be the year when a global climate change deal covering all countries, rich and poor, small and large, will finally be agreed. Polita Clark, Financial Times.